Tonight's talk is the second in a series of three. And if you can't hear me at the back, raise your hand, okay? Okay, fine. So I'd like to give start with a brief recap of last night's talk. which is about the fact that the Buddha did not take a position on whether there is or is not a self. We've often heard the Buddha said there is no self, there is no soul, but he actually did not. The one time he was asked point blank, <clears throat> is there a self, is there no self, he just stayed silent. It's not the question that he would put aside. But he does treat what he calls the issue of I-making and my-making, the way we create a sense of self, the perception of self, he treats it as a form of karma. In this way, and for this reason, he treats it as he does all sorts of karma. The question of what's unskillful and what's skillful in a worldly sense. And then there are the actions that are actually skillful in putting an end to karma. So there's a kind of eye-making that is unskillful. There's a kind of eye-making that's skillful in a worldly sense. And finally, there's a kind of eye-making or my-making that puts an end to eye-making and my-making. That's the path of practice. <clears throat> You'll notice that when the Buddha set forth his path of practice, he's talking about using fabricated conditions in a way that will lead to the end of fabrication. You don't simply stop acting in order to come to the end of karma. It would be like putting the brakes on a, on a truck when it's going really fast. Instead, you learn to act in progressively more and more skillful ways, develop progressively more and more skillful and harmless intentions and to finally reach that point where intention is no longer needed. In the same way, you don't just drop your eye-making. You make your sense of eye, or your many senses of eye, and we'll, we can talk about that later in, in the evening here today, more and more skillful until you no longer need them. And so the, the question the Buddha is answering is not, is there a self or is there no self? But the question is, what is skillful? What when I do it? In the sense, what is what kind of eye-making or my-making will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. Notice this is a reverse of how the questions of karma and not-self are usually seen. Usually karma is the framework, excuse me, not-self is the framework, and karma is placed in, try to place that inside the framework. In other words, if there is no self, i.e. framework, then who does the karma and who experiences the results? But the Buddha actually looked at the questions the other way around. Given that there is karma, that people do act, and they do create a sense of self, then when is it skillful karma to hold to a sense or a perception of self? What senses of self are skillful at what times? And when is it skillful to put the perception of self away and put, replace it with a perception of not-self? And then ultimately, when is it skillful to put aside all perceptions at the end of the path? That was basically what we discussed last night. Tonight's topic is going to be understanding the Buddhist teachings and how to make an eye, or how to make your various eyes. In a way that leads to long-term welfare and happiness. So the first question here is why would, you, why would it be necessary to do this? If you're ultimately going to develop a perception of not-self, why spend time developing a perception of healthy self? And the answers lie first in the Buddha's analysis of suffering, or dukkha, suffering or stress. When he talks about the first noble truth, he identifies stress as the five clinging aggregates, with the emphasis on the clinging. The aggregates, you may know them, are form, feeling, perceptions, mental fabrications, and sensory consciousness. And these things are burdensome to the mind because we cling to them. An analogy might Teacher, John, or one of my teachers, a John Sawat, once made. He pointed to the, the mountain off to the east of the monastery. We, we live across the valley from Mount Palomar. He pointed to Mount Palomar. He says, Mount Palomar, is that mountain over there, is that heavy? And you know, when, it, when your teacher asks you a question like that, you know, <laughs> he's ready to spring a trap on you. And his answer was, well, it's heavy if you try to pick it up. <laughs> If, it's, if you don't try to pick it up, it may be heavy in and of itself, but at least it's not heavy on you. And so the aggregates are heavy for the mind because we try to cling to them. In and of themselves, they're not suffering. Okay? 
Now, what's interesting in Pali is that the word for clinging, upadana, also refers to the act of taking sustenance. In other words, feeding on things. The fact that we try to feed on these aggregates in order to find happiness, that's why we suffer from them. Now, we feed in four ways. We feed through our passion for sensuality, through our views, through our habits and practices, and through our opinions of what is or is not the self. Now, the thing is about these four ways of clinging is that even though they cause suffering, they also do provide some nourishment for the mind. Otherwise, we wouldn't bother. It's like chewing on cardboard. You don't go into any sustenance from the mind, so we don't chew on cardboard. Well, maybe that's not a good analogy. I once read of a, an experiment where they fed mice on a brand of cereal, and for the test group, they shredded up the cardboard of the box, and they gave that to another group of mice. And they found out that the second group of mice was healthier than the first group. <laughs> so, but at any rate, think of something that would provide absolutely no nourishment at all. We wouldn't bother trying to feed on it. The things that the, the aggregates do provide some nourishment, and so that's why we feed on them. And the fact is that we need to use this nourishment until we can get the mind to the point where it doesn't need nourishment anymore. So the Buddha does has us use these three for, these forms of clinging as steps in the path. In other words, he does allow a certain amount of sensory pleasure in terms of using the four requisites for life, in terms of food, clothing, shelter, and medicine. He says, try to use it so it's just enough. He also has us develop right views and cling to those right views as long as we need them. He also has us hold two precepts and to the practice of jhana. That's clinging to habits and practices. And he also has us develop a healthy sense of self. That's self-reliant, responsible, and heedful. The purpose of this is to develop five strengths in the mind. Conviction, persistence, mindfulness, concentration, and discernment. These are the qualities that bring the mind to a point where it no longer needs to feed. Now, conviction here would be conviction both in the awakening of the Buddha and conviction in the principle that your actions are important that you're the one responsible for deciding what to do. Your actions really do give results, and the results do depend on the quality of mind with which you act. Persistence here means right effort, trying to develop skillful qualities and un abandon unskillful ones. Mindfulness means keeping either the body in mind, feelings, mind states, or mental qualities in mind. Concentration means developing singleness of mind, as we're practicing just now. And then discernment means seeing things in terms of the Four Noble Truths. Now, of these five qualities, concentration is the one that the Buddha tends to most describe in terms of nourishment along the path. There's one analogy where he talks about the path as being like building a fo fortress on a, on a frontier. And concentration, he says, is the, the food that you provide for all the people living in the fortress, the rice and the honey and the butter, and other things that they need. And so, my, so concentration, in which does include the practice of mindfulness, is necessary both as giving sustenance for the mind and also for, to get the mind still enough so it can actually see itself in action. Because it's only when the mind is still that you can begin to notice what's moving and what's not moving in the mind. And John Lee, one of my teacher's teachers, once made an analogy. He said, if you were born on a train, and the train was always moving, you'd look out the windows, and you wouldn't know what moves and what doesn't move, because everything moves, because you're moving. Okay. Trees move, mountains move, people move, cars move. It's only when you got off the train and stood still that you can see, okay, the mountains and trees are not moving, it's the people and the cars that are moving. In the same way, if you want to see the movements of the mind, you have to get the mind very, very still. And so to develop this quality of mind requires strong dedication, discipline, persistence. In other words, you have to cling to the practice in order to get good at it. Okay. Concentration also develops a healthy sense of self. In other words, you develop a sense of competence. As most of People who do have a healthy sense of self develop it around their set of skills. And if you develop skill in concentrating the mind, the mind gets a healthier sense of self, so that when it comes to the, the time comes to apply the perception of not-self to all things, this is not done out of a neurotic self-hatred, 
but it's through an understanding that you've taken your healthy sense of self as far as it can go. Now you're ready for the next step in developing your maturity. An image you might think of is like a bird in a cage. Okay, the bird flies from one wall of the cage to another, and it clings to this wall, and it clings to that wall. Well, it turns out one wall of the cage is actually the door. You know, if you've ever had a parakeet in a cage, you made the mistake of opening the door when the parakeet was clinging to the door, the parakeet was out. Well, in the same way, you might think of the path as something that you cling to, but it's like the door to the cage. When the door finally swings open, you're free. So, when we talk about this strategy of self, we're going to look at it in terms of that question. What, when I do it, will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness? And this includes the idea both of yourself as a producer and as a consumer of that happiness. When you say, what can I do, that talks about your element of control. Exactly what things can you control? You can control your body to a certain extent. You can control your thoughts to a certain extent. And in those ways, in the various ways that you do have that control, you can think of yourself as a producer. Hopefully a producer of happiness, but we often find that we create a lot of suffering by mistake. So we want to look into that. The issue of long-term welfare and happiness, we're talking here about a relative permanence to begin with. It's not absolute permanence, but it's heading in that direction. And finally, when we put in the word, my long-term welfare and happiness, we're talking about the self as a consumer of that happiness. So the motivation for practice comes first in one in the use of conceit. The conceit is this, if others can do this, why can't I? We're talking about the producer of happiness. Then there's what's called the self as a governing pr principle. And here's a quote from the canon where the Buddha talks about using this sense of self to motivate you to practice. He says, it's not for the sake of clothing that I've gone forth from the home life into homelessness. It's not for the sake of food, for the sake of lodgings, or the sake of this or that future becoming. It's not for the sake of honor and fame. It's simply that I am beset by birth, aging, and death, by sorrows, lamentations, pains, distress, and despair. Beset by stress, overcome with stress. And so I hope perhaps the end of this entire mass of suffering and stress might be known. Now if I were to go back and seek the same sort of sensual pleasures that I abandoned in going forth, or for a worse sort, that would not be fitting for me. You can translate this into lay life. You've been practicing to find a true happiness, and so if you start reverting to your old happiness, you basically wouldn't be showing goodwill for yourself. And so in this case, you're trying to develop a sense of the consumer who's very picky about your happiness. And it's good to have that kind of picky consumer. Because right? that keeps you on the path to look for happiness that's really genuine. <clears throat> now the traditional answers to this question lie around what are called the development of merit. In other words, you practice generosity, you practice virtue, and you develop a meditation on goodwill because these give rise to a strong sense of inner worth and inner well-being. There's a pleasure that comes from being generous. You gain a sense of your own freedom. You have the choice to give, the choice not to give, and you are moved to give. You look back on that act and it gives you a sense of well-being, that you haven't been born and just as a weight on the world. As for virtue, you can think of times when you've been tempted to lie or steal or cheat, but you said, no, that's beneath me. People can give you a million dollars to lie and you say no. That means, okay, I've got a precept that's worth more than a million dollars. When you develop goodwill, you think that you're developing a sense of happiness that doesn't harm anyone and you ha wish no harm for anyone. That too creates a sense of self-worth. The Buddha also has us look more, even more carefully at our actions. And the precepts are pretty rough guides. You know, no killing, no stealing, no... No illicit sex, no lies, no alcohol. It's pretty general. Now, there are a lot of areas of life that those precepts don't cover. How do you, how do you have a skillful relationship? <laughs> it's not covered in, that, in those precepts. It's a general thing. You don't cheat on the other person. But beyond that, where else, how, what, how can you make your re relationship more skillful? <clears throat> in this way, it's useful to think of something I... I saw when I was in Alaska years back. You know, in Alaska they have a lot of very ignorant people coming from the lower 48 states. And you're up in the, in the wilderness and you're going to have your wilderness experience. And a lot of people know zilch about how to survive in the wilderness in Alaska. And so in order to prevent a lot of problems, they put up several years back a big billboards all over the states, which were called 
bear awareness. Okay. <laughs> How to be aware of bears. Okay. Okay. And they gave a series of do's and don'ts. Okay. You see a bear, don't run away. Um, raise your arms. Try to make yourself look bigger than you are by raising your arms because bears have very ba- bad eyesight. Um, really. <laughs> Speak to the bear in a calm voice. (laughs) If the bear charges you, again, don't run away. If the bear attacks you, lie down and play dead. Okay, that's 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 as far as the do's and don'ts go. Okay, because then if the bear starts chewing on you, You have to discern, is this bear chewing on me out of hunger or is it chewing on me out of curiosity? If you sense that the bear is chewing on you out out of curiosity, just let it chew because it'll it'll lose its curiosity very quickly. It's trying to see if you're dead or not. Um, And if it's chewing you out of hunger, however, you've got to fight back for all you're worth. So everything up until the bear charges you, those are pretty easy do's and don'ts may not be easy to follow them, but they're very simple and very clear, right? Okay. It's, you know, when the bear is chewing on you, you have to use your mindfulness and discernment. <laughs> they didn't use those words on the billboards, but that's what they're talking about. <clears throat> and then you have to really read, be able to read the situation. And so there's more than just the precepts that lo- make us look at our life to see what's skillful and not. The Buddha gave some instructions to his son one time. The son was only seven years, at, years old at the time. And he basically told his son, when you look at your actions, look at them as you look at yourself in a mirror. In other words, before you act, ask yourself, this action that I'm going to do, what are the results going to be? Now, if you foresee that there's going to be any harm, you don't do it. If harm for yourself, harm for other people, you don't do it. If you don't foresee any harm, either for yourself or for others, then you can act. While you're doing it, again, check the results that are actually coming about. <clears throat> and if you see that there's some un- unexpected harm, then you stop. If you don't see any unexpected harm coming up, then you continue with your action. When you're done, look at the long-term results. Okay, if there's harm that came, then make the resolve that you're not going to repeat that mistake and go and talk it over to someone else on the path to see if they can give you some advice. If, however, you see that nobody was harmed, and he said, take joy in the fact that you're practicing well, that you're developing more and more skill in the path. And so this is training to be more skillful and more mature, not only on the blatant level, but also it goes into the mind. The physical actions, verbal actions, and also mental actions. And this applies to your eye-making and mind-making. So you learn how to look at your sense of eye simply as an action and then check its results. If you see that it's causing harm, talk it over with someone else and see what other sense of I or my that you can use to replace it. If you see that it caused no harm, then it's be part of your set of skills. Another sense of I that might be useful. So what you're doing in this process, you're, you're learning how to disidentify with your less skillful habits, your less skillful intentions and desires, and learn how to identify more and more with the skillful ones realizing that we all have our faults. And basically, the Buddha's not teaching his son here not to make mistakes, but he's saying, when you make a mistake, this is how you handle it. Years back, I was talking about this passage in Santa Fe, and there was a woman there who was a a therapist running a mindfulness-based therapy group. And the next night was going to be the final meeting of the group, and so she took this particular passage where the Buddha's teaching his son, Xeroxed it off, and then handed it out to everybody else, everybody in the group had them read it, and they said, okay, suppose that your parents had taught you this. What do you think would happen? And they all said, if our parents had taught us like this, we wouldn't need this therapy group. (laughs) It's basically being a mature parent, teaching your child how to make mistakes and learn from them. And then at the same time, as you learn from them, you learn to have a more and more mature attitude towards your mistakes and learning how to put the mistakes aside and focus on becoming more and more skillful. So those are the traditional ways the Buddha would talk about developing a sense of healthy self. But we can also compare the Buddha's teachings on making a healthy sense of self with Freud's teachings on ego functioning. 
because there is a widespread misunderstanding that the Buddha teaches egolessness. Now this is a misunderstanding. The Buddha doesn't teach egolessness. The fact that this word has gotten out has two unfortunate consequences. One, among some people who adopt the idea, it becomes an excuse for self-hatred and what they call spiritual bypassing. Do you know spiritual bypassing? Is that a word they use here on the East Coast? Sometimes, okay. It means basically trying to use your spiritual practice and so that you don't have to develop maturity in the rest of your life. You know, sit long hours and retreat, chant a lot, do a lot of prostrations and hope that that's going to clean up your life. Okay. That's called spiritual bypassing. <laughs> okay. It doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> the bypass leads you off the side of the cliff. Okay. Um, there are other people, though, who hear the idea that the Buddha teaches egolessness and they get abhorred by the idea. They believe that Buddhism lacks a proper understanding of the ego because we need an ego to function, right, in this world. And therefore that Buddhism needs insights from Western psychology on a healthy ego functioning in order to be a complete teaching of a healthy heart and mind. Actually, the Buddhist teachings contain all the elements that would go into the notion of a healthy ego functioning. And even the not-self teaching is presented by the Buddha as a kind of healthy ego functioning, even, even though he doesn't use the word ego functioning, and that's what it is. Um, to explain this, first, you know, the, the Freud's, Freud's teachings on, on the ego is this ego is a sense of self that's needed for survival in negotiating the d demands of the superego and the id. Now, you know, the id is basically your raw desires. Superego is a sense of shoulds and should-nots that we've picked up from society. And as we all know, that our desires tend to be in conflict with those shoulds and should not. So there's a, there are functions in the mind that learn how to negotiate the needs of these, or the demands of these two sides. That's Freud's perspective. If we take the Buddhist perspective, there are a number of adjustments that we have to make in that picture. One is, from the Buddhist point of view, the, the superego is a lot friendlier than the, than the superego that the Freud was talking about. The Freudian superego basically comes from a monotheistic tradition where you have a god who creates laws which don't really seem to have anything to do with whether you're going to be happy or not obeying those laws. Just like, okay, God says this, you've got to obey. Okay. Whereas in Buddhism, the Buddhist version of a superego super is the Four Noble Truths. In other words, each of the Four Noble Truths has a task. Um, you want to comprehend suffering, you want to abandon its cause, you want to realize its cessation, and you want to develop the path to its cessation. Now, all of those are duties that are one conditional. I mean, if you want to put an end to suffering, this is what you have to do. Nobody's forcing this on you. And two, the purpose of all of these <coughs> shoulds and duties is for your own true happiness. So this changes the dynamic. All the shoulds in Buddhism are aimed at your true happiness. And so within the Buddhist context, the purpose of the ego is your long-term happiness. It's not just survival. We said that question that lies at the beginning of wisdom, what when I do it will lead to my long-term welfare and happiness. That's the function of the ego from the Buddhist point of view. Okay. So basically you've got your, <coughs> your superego and your ego are working together. Of course your ids, ids, and it's good to talk with these in plurals, okay? Your ids have lots of desires for, for happiness, and so it's a matter of basically making them understand, okay, what's really going to make you happy? It's, it's just the short-term gratification of running around, <clears throat> dressing up in green. <laughs> it's not going to lead to long-term happiness, you know? <laughs> so you've got to talk to your id about this, okay? <clears throat> Thirdly, from the Buddhist point of view, the, the maneuvers of the ego, or the function of the ego, he would call strategies. And we, talk, we tend to talk about ego defenses, that the ego is this very defensive, kind of sweaty character. Um, and from the Buddhist point of view, it's more wise strategies that we're talking about here. These strategies don't have to be self-conscious. In fact, a large part of the meditation is learning, bringing a lot of this subconscious stuff in your mind up to the surface so you can actually see it and negotiate. Also, from the Buddhist point of view, there's a different reality principle. From Freud's point of view, happiness is basically a zero-sum game. Some people are going to have it, and other people are going to have to lose it. But from the Buddhist point of view, true happiness is something that 
comes from within, doesn't require that you take anything from anyone else. And so ultimately, there's, there's no need for conflict. Also, the Buddha, the Buddha doesn't make a clear distinction between your head and your heart. Each desire comes with its own rationale, and each reason is associated with a particular desire. So, so the Buddha would teach you that virtue, generosity, and meditation bring happiness that don't create kind of happiness that doesn't create boundaries. In other words, so we're working for the happiness, not only your happiness, the happiness of others. So that particular boundary gets more and more blurred. And the boundary that does become relevant is the one, okay, what's the distinction between what's skillful and what's not? So everyone benefits when you follow these strategies. I was reading a book a while back, it was called The Wisdom of the Ego, by a guy named George Valiant. Does anyone know that book? Yeah, okay. Um, where he talks about different kinds of ego functions. And I found it interesting that when he finally gets, to, you know, after talking about neurotic ego functions and psychotic ego functions and immature ones, he finally gets to a list of mature ego functions. These are the functions that are actually good for you. And it turns out that the list, even though he uses a different vocabulary, is very similar to a lot of basic Buddhist teachings. His list is this, suppression, which is not repression. Suppression is basically you've got an unskillful desire and you realize you can't act on it. Now, it's different from repression. Repression is when you deny that it's even there. Okay. Okay. So the first one is suppression. The second one is sublimation. Okay, when you've got a desire that you know is unskillful and you learn how to focus that desire on a goal that's more skillful. Anticipation is when you see dangers down the line that you've got to prepare for. You don't just get apathetic. Altruism, when you see that your happiness cannot depend on the suffering of other people, so you have to take their their happiness into consideration. And then finally, humor. You have to have a sense of humor about yourself, be able to laugh in a good-natured way about your own mistakes. And this way you learn how to survive. Okay. Now the Buddha has teachings on all five of these characteristics. Instead of suppression, he would talk about restraint. You learn how to exercise restraint over your thoughts, your words, your deeds. Seeing if something is unhealthy or something is going to be harmful, you learn how to say no to yourself. And then you learn how to practice sublimation. From his point of view, the primary source of sublimation is concentration practice. You sit down and breathe and breathe in a sense in a way that can give rise to ease, can give rise to rapture and refreshment right when you need it. What you might call a, a, a jhana hit. Okay? When things get really, really difficult, it's like, I can't stand it, I've got to go out, I've got a real itch for something. It's okay, breathe down through your hands, breathe down through your feet, make it nice and relaxed. And a sense of rapture and a sense of ease can develop. That's sublimation from his point of view. Anticipation would be his, he would use the word heedfulness. You have to realize that your actions matter, there really are dangers out there. And so you have to be heedful. Now this covers an understanding both of karma and of your responsibility. That your actions would make a difference. I mean, if there are dangers out there and your actions made no difference, heedfulness would not be required. But you have to be careful about what you do. That was the Buddha's last teaching. He says, you know, work with heedfulness. Practice with heedfulness. As for altruism, there's an interesting teaching in the canon. Josh, it's in Udana 5.1. Okay where King Basenadi, <coughs> who was a king at the time of the Buddha, is in his private chambers with one of his queens, Queen Malika. And in a very tender moment he turns to her and says, Malika, is there anyone you love more than yourself? Now you know what he's thinking, right? She said, yes, your majesty, you. Okay, right? Okay. Well, it turns out Queen Malika is uh, no dumb cookie, okay? <laughs> she looks at him and she says, no. There's nobody I love more than myself. And how about you? <laughs> and he says, well, you're right. <laughs> There's nobody I love more than myself. End of scene, okay? You can see why they don't make movies of the polycanon. You know? <laughs> the scenes don't develop very far. <laughs> so the king goes down to see the Buddha, reports their conversation. And the Buddha says, she's right. You know, you go around the world and you see nobody that you would love more than yourself. And at the same time, he said, all you find are people who love themselves very fiercely. So when you take this into consideration, and he has an interesting conclusion, you would never want to harm anyone. 
Now, there are two ways you can read that. One is you realize that you love yourself, other people love themselves, and there should be a sense of empathy. Everyone wants happiness. This is something we all have in common. The other way you can read this is that if your happiness is going to depend on their suffering and they don't want to suffer, they're not going to, care, they're not going to allow your happiness to continue. So if you want a happiness that's long-term, you have to take their happiness into consideration as well. This, this is the principle of goodwill, this is the principle of compassion. So that's the Buddhist version of altruism. As for humor, if you look in the right places, there's a lot of humor in the Pali Canon. One of my favorite stories is of a monk who is meditating and he sees a group of devas, these are kind of heavenly beings. And so he goes up and he's like, hey, you guys are up in, up in heaven, you have a better perspective on things. Where does the physical universe end? And the devas say, oh, we don't know. But there are devas who are higher than we are, maybe they know. So the med monk goes back into meditation and he sees the next higher level of devas. And he asks them, okay, where does the physical universe end? And they say, we don't know. But there's a higher level of devas, maybe they know. And I think there are at least 10 or 12 levels in the bureaucracy here. It gets sent up. Okay. Finally, there's one group of devas, okay, we don't know, but there is the great Brahma. And if you meditate and you get a flash of light and the great Brahma will appear, and if he does, then you can ask him. So finally there's a flash of light, the Brahma appears, and so the monk asks him, okay, where does the physical universe end? And the great Brahma says, I am the great Brahma, nor of all, seer of all, creator of all, father of all, that ever has, or ever has been and will be. Okay. Now if this were the book of Job, the monk would say, okay, I understand. Okay. <laughs> but this is not the book of Job. The monk says, that's not what I asked you. <laughs> <laughs> Where does the physical universe end? The great Brahma says, I am the great Brahma, nor of all, seer of all, father of all, creator of all, <laughs> and that ever has been or will be. Okay. This goes on three times. Okay. Finally, the great Brahma pulls the monk aside and says, look, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> but I have this adoring retinue, and it would get them very upset if they heard that I said I didn't know something. And so he sends the, the monk back down to see the Buddha, and the Buddha says, you're asking the wrong question. The question should be, what state of mind does the physical universe no longer, is it no longer gain a footing? Uh, and then he talks about the consciousness of the awakened mind. There's another story. Most of the good stories are in the Vinaya, and I'll talk about this in a minute. Each rule in the Vinaya, or the, monks, the monastic discipline, has a story which explains why the Buddha formulated the rule. And a lot of them have... A, good sense of humor. One of my favorite ones is of a monk who had some psychic powers and one day he goes into this shrine and the shrine is occupied by a fire-breathing naga or serpent. And the fire-breathing naga is upset that this monk has come into a shrine. And so he breathes fire at the monk. And so the monk enters concentration, he breathes fire back at the serpent. And then the serpent tries to blaze up and the monk blazes up. And finally he catch, captures the serpent and puts him in his bowl show that he has control over the serpent. Okay? And then he spends the night in the shrine. Then he lets the serpent go. Now, word of this gets out. And people say, cool, this monk has a lot of psychic powers. You know, if we make merit with him, we're going to get a lot of merit for sure. And so they want their merit to be extra special. And so they go to a group of monks and they ask, well, what is it monks don't usually get in their alms bowl? And it turns out they go to the wrong group of monks. And the group of monks says, hard liquor. Okay? <laughs> And so the next morning, all the people in the city prepare hard liquor for this monk. His name is Saketa. <laughs> and so he goes from house to house, and he gets a glass of hard liquor at every house. Well, you can imagine. Even with his psychic powers, um, he passes out by the gate to the city. <laughs> and so at this point, the Buddha comes along with the monks, and they see Saketa, the monk, lying there, passed out. So they carry him back to the monastery. They get him back to the monastery, and they lay him down on the ground with his head to the Buddha. And of course, he's, he turns around, he turns around, flips over, and finally gets his feet in the Buddha's face. Okay? And so the Buddha says, wasn't Sageta in the past, wasn't he respectful to us? And they say, yes. Is he being respectful now? No. And didn't he do battle with the fire-breathing Naga? Yes. 
Could he do battle with a salamander now? No. <laughs> so, so there is humor in the canon, if you look in the right spots. And as I said, it's largely in the origin stories for the rules. And I think this is important, because when you're setting up a set of rules for governing human behavior, you have to have a sense of humor. If you're really going to understand human beings, and if the rules are really going to be livable. And so I think it's an important part of the, the, the Buddha's approach to morality. It's not strict and puritanical. He's got an understanding of human nature. This is the way human beings are. You've got to provide for that. There's one rule where the Buddha says, okay, no sexual intercourse. And everybody, okay, all the monastics learn, okay, no sexual intercourse. And then there's a group of monks one day who goes to visit this one monk who lives off alone. He's got a pet monkey. Uh -huh. And so the monk isn't there, and so the monks come up to visit his hut, and the pet monkey comes up, and she starts acting in very strange ways. Okay? Um, and so they say, <coughs> something's going on here. And so they go off and they hide in the bushes. And sure enough, the monk comes back to the hut. The monkey comes up and greets him in her way. <laughs> and so then the monk gives, her, gives the monkey some food, and then they have intercourse. And so the monks come out and say, hey, wait a minute, isn't there a rule against intercourse? And the monk says, oh, that only uh, applies to human beings. <laughs> <laughs> so word of this gets to the Buddha, and so he has to actually explicitly put it in the rule. No sex with anybody, and not even animals, okay? <laughs> so if you're going to make rules for people, you have to understand human nature. And to understand human nature, you have to have a sense of humor. So... All of these are classical ego functions from the Freudian point of view, and they're all things that the Buddha teaches. He teaches you to exercise restraint, i.e. suppression, find practices that give rise to an immediate sense of well-being. That's his sublimation. Be heedful about the dangers in the future and the fact that your actions are really going to be important in protecting you from those dangers. So heedfulness corresponds to anticipation. He teaches compassion, which corresponds to altruism, and he teaches humor throughout the canon. So, so those are the teachings on wisdom, the teachings on compassion, and the teachings that the Buddha gave to his son Rahula about looking at your actions and learning how to read the results of your actions and then to resolve not to, re to repeat those mistakes. That's his teachings on how to develop purity. So if we look at the way the Buddha teaches you, he's, he's teaching you to be intelligent about your pursuit of happiness. And in so doing, you develop what are called the three distinctive virtues of the Buddha, wisdom, compassion, and purity. These all grow out of healthy ego functioning from his point of view. So the important lesson that you learn about happiness in looking at these ways is that mastering the ways of attaining happiness that harm no one else. Don't harm yourself, don't harm other, other people. Okay, this is where your happiness is going to be true. When you act in this way, you see there's no sharp line between your happiness and the happiness of those around you. And this is the closest that the Buddha gets to the topic of interconnectedness. He doesn't say that we're interconnected by nature. We're interconnected through the way we interact or act with other people. And so for that interconnectedness to be healthy, you have to work on developing um, intentions that are going to be harmless and acting on those intentions. So as you do this, you begin to focus less and less on the my in your happiness and more and more on the issues of what you do simply to have great happiness, period, across the board. So you think, see things term less and less in terms of my versus other people, me versus other people, and more and more in terms of, well, what's the difference between the skillful response here and what's the unskillful response? And this makes it easier and easier to start disidentifying with your I-making and my-making. The I and mind become more porous in their boundaries. Okay? So first you disidentify with the ones, that, the way of uh, kinds of self-identification that are unskillful. And you learn to work more and more ways where you develop a sense of skillful that is more, co that is more competent. But in so doing, your sense of self fades into the background. You become more and more sensitive to issues of cause and effect. In this way, the skillful selfing makes it easier to engage in skillful not selfing, okay? Disidentifying first with the unskillful aspects of your behavior, and then it gets more and more refined. If we try to let go of our sense of self because we hate it, that encourages a form of neurosis. 
But when you've seen through your practice how your selfing is an activity, and that there are uses and limitations to engaging in that activity, okay, you want to let go more and more thoroughly, and ultimately in so doing you find a happiness that doesn't depend on any activity at all, which was the whole purpose of your ego functioning to begin with. I mean, basically, your ego, the Buddhist notion of ego actually leads you to a point where you can let go of your sense of self when you no longer need it. As long as you need it, he says, work on it. And so it's in this way that the Buddha teaches healthy selfing, that it's an important part of creating nourishment for yourself on the path and also putting the mind in a position where it can actually see its selfing activity or its eye-making and mind-making as it happens. And given the fact that you're learning how to develop a healthier sense of self, when the time comes that you see that the only thing standing between you and full awakening is that sense of self, you can let go of it a lot more easily. It's like when you sit down to meditate, you think about what you did in the course of the day, and if there are a lot of unskillful things you did, it's very sticky narratives, it's very hard to let them go. But if you think about what you did in the course of the day, and you didn't harm yourself, you didn't harm anyone else, Okay, those er narratives are easy to put aside, you can focus on the present moment. In the same way, when your sense of self becomes more and more competent because you've developed a greater sense of set of skills in dealing with yourself and with other people, then when the time comes to let that self go, you can let it go easily. So those are my thoughts on that topic tonight. And I was wondering if there are any questions. Okay. Let me find my watch first so I know what we're doing. Okay. Any questions? <laughs>